<laughs> Having dinner together. And somebody's yelling at us. And somebody's <laughs> yelling at me. I mean, what more can we ask for? And most importantly, we're learning more about Jesus. So I thought to myself, it doesn't get any better than this. So tonight we're going to be, for those of you who brought Bibles or devices, we're going to be in Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. I'm going to read it, and I'm going to do a little bit of background on it, and then we'll dive in and actually look at what it's telling us. 1619. 1619 through 31. And it goes like this. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living the splendor in splendor every day. Now there was a rich uh, and a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table besides even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom and the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he being the rich man, lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things, and now he is being comforted, and you are in agony. That's another way of saying no. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and none may cross over from there to us. And he said, this is the rich man again, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, No. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, once again, Abraham to the rich man, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Odd little story. This is the only occasion where Jesus ever opened the veil between this world and the next world. So he opened it up so we could get a glimpse of it. He allowed us to see for a brief time what is beyond and to see the relationship between life in this world and life after we die. So um, I want to set the context for this before we actually get back into the scripture, into the passage. And uh, this is in the Gospel of Luke, as I said, it was written about 60 AD. So uh, 60 years into uh, following the, the birth of Christ. Now, author, or, uh, Luke was the only Gentile author of any part of the New Testament. He was born in what is now known as Syria, so he was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. And uh, the only Gentile author of any book in the New Testament. And he also wasn't an eyewitness to the ministry of Jesus. We're told that in his own gospel. He was a researcher. So... At the beginning of his gospel, he gives us a disclaimer. I didn't witness it myself, but I've carefully studied everything, and I've set all the facts about the life and ministry of Jesus into order. So Luke, not being an eyewitness to the ministry of Jesus, was primarily an evangelist. He was a close friend of the Apostle Paul's, and he actually accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys into the Gentile world. So he was involved in the spread of Christianity after the day of Pentecost. And in addition to writing the gospel that carries his name, he wrote the book of Acts, which is actually an excellent 
history of the missionary journeys of Paul. Luke was the author. He accompanied Paul. You can tell from the text of Acts. He accompanied, accompanied Paul in many, many of those journeys and many of the experiences. Now Luke was a physician by training. The uh, epistle to the Colossians tells us that. So he was a, an educated man in the times. And he had a distinctive approach. His gospel is different in many respects than the others because he displayed an unusual interest in medical matters. There are many passages in the Gospel of Luke where he demonstrates this curiosity about medical matters. He also demonstrated a, an uncommon interest in individuals. He focuses on individual case histories in his Gospel. And he finally displayed an interest in details. Luke is a very, very detailed Gospel. So these characteristics are really all apparent in our passage tonight. As we go through, you might keep that in mind and you'll see what I'm, what I'm talking about. So um, I want to thank Kurt for the inspiration for doing this Bible study tonight. Last Sunday, I saw him and he had been talking about this passage with his mom and she had raised lots of questions about it. And he came to me and said, what do you think? So I started telling him what I think. And afterwards, I thought, well, I probably ought to read it before I tell him what I think. So I read it, and uh, I got really intrigued and got inspired to put this Bible study together, and I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. So Kurt's very good questions focused me on the true nature and purpose of this strange passage, and it's really awesome. It's, uh, I might say, before we go any further, this is intended by Jesus to be a parable as compared to a story about real individuals. Now, you, you may recall that the definition of a parable is it's a simple story that's used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson of great significance. Simple story used to illustrate something of far greater moral or spiritual significance. This is a unique parable because it's the only parable in the Gospels that mentions anyone by name. The poor man is referred to as Lazarus by name. Um, and interestingly, although the rich man is not referred to by name in our translation, in the Vulgate translation, which is the Catholic translation, he is named. And he's named Devis. Devis. The rich man was Devis. Now, the uniqueness of this parable is partly explained by the meaning of these names. And I think it goes to the conclusion that while they're named, they're not really named. Uh, Lazarus means God is my helper, so uh, God was Lazarus' helper. This is a condition rather than a name, and um, even the name and divas is Latin in the Vulgate Bible, it means rich man. So God is my helper and the rich man. So even the names of the players are connected to the lesson that we're going to learn in this parable. So, interestingly, I always like to look what's around the uh, passage that I'm studying to see what came before, what came after. And interestingly, uh, this parable grows out of a reaction that the Pharisees had to a very well-known teaching of Jesus that appears right before this parable in Luke 16. And that's the parable of the unjust steward. The unjust steward. And in that parable, Jesus, who was speaking to the Pharisees, emphasized the link between money and spirituality. The parable of the unjust steward is all about money and spirituality. <clears throat> and the point of that parable was to be pleasing to God, man must love God and use money rather than use God and love money. Now, the Pharisees did not react well to the parable of the unjust steward. Luke in chapter 16 at verse 14 says, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, that's why they didn't react well, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And scoffing, of course, is speaking to someone in a really scornful, mocking way. So they were getting on Jesus big time because he had just offended them beyond all belief. But this wasn't unusual because this cold legalistic culture that we know as the Pharisees was the subject of constant tension with Jesus throughout the Gospels. Time and time again, he has conflict with the Pharisees. 
So you may remember a Pharisee was a member of a Jewish sect. It was the uh, merchant class. So these were people that, you know, relatively speaking, were wealthy in that society. And they were distinguished by strict observance of the traditional and written law. And they commonly were held to have uh, predispositions about superior sanctity. They were self-righteous. They were self-righteous. And this is what Jesus had to say about them in general. And this kind of says it all. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, you clean, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. He had a lot of conflict with them, to say the least, and they knew it. And so when he lays the parable of the unjust steward on him, they do not react well at all. So this parable we're studying tonight is Jesus' response to their ridicule and scoffing. You know, he went at them, they came back at him, and he just went back for more, and that's what we're going to study tonight. So let's go through it verse by verse. And there's some really uh, amazing points in this brief passage. So we'll start in verses 19 and 20. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at the gate, covered with sores. So Jesus is drawing a vivid picture, a vivid contrast between the rich man and the poor man. Now the rich man, his whole being is uh, external. His whole being is represented by externality. We're told that he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, and that was the garb of the rich. In that society, purple was the most expensive dye that you could buy, and so it was always the choice of the noble and royal people in that society. So this guy dressed in purple. He either was noble and royal, or he was a, a wannabe noble uh, and royal person. We're also told that he was generously, uh, joyously living in splendor every day. But he lived a hollow life concerned only with the love of display, look at me, and the desire for self-indulgence. Dressing well, eating well every day, living the good life. He had it all going on from an external appearance at least. Now the poor man, who is named in this translation, Name means, Hi, so. Hi, how are his you? name means God is my helper. Now that's more of a status than a name as I mentioned. And uh, even though he was a beggar and a poor man, he was a godly man. He was a godly man. The rich man was not. So verse 21 tells us, And longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table, besides even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. So this poor guy was fantasizing over the joyous life that the rich man lived. He was fantasizing over the crumbs that would fall off his table. He was so hungry, but no one noticed him. He was ignored. <clears throat> We're told in verse 20 that he was covered with sores, completely ignored, and the only worldly help that this poor man had was from the dogs who were licking his sores. Now Liz would tell you that those dogs are gifts from God. And they're put in our lives to meet a need that we may have at the time. Maybe exactly a lot right. of people believe that. <laughs> exactly right. I don't dare have any sores because I don't want to find out. But in any event, the dogs were the only 
mechanism that gave him any comfort in this life as they licked his sores. A dog will love you when nobody else will. Yeah, well, that's that's true. That's true. That's quite a picture, too. So, <clears throat> Jesus has set the contrast now between the rich man and the poor man. But I want you to keep in mind as we go through the... As we go through the... Step it up? Okay. As, as we go through the passage... <laughs> This parable isn't about the contrast between the rich and the poor. It involves a rich man and a poor man, but that's not what it's about. We'll come back to that. So verse 22. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. So the rich man probably had a magnificent funeral. He was buried in the splendor that he lived. The poor man, in comparison was probably thrown in the city dump and burned, which was customary at that time for the undesirables. In fact, in Jerusalem, there's a dump in an area that was called the Valley of Ben Pinnom, and uh, also known as Gehenna. And in 2 Chronicles 28.3, we were told that that little valley outside of Jerusalem was first tainted by child sacrifices to a pagan god known as Molech. So, it was always smoldering. It was the place where the citizens of Jerusalem dumped their trash, <coughs> threw poor dead people when they died, and there was always smoldering and a fire going on. And so these poor people, like the, uh, like the poor man Lazarus, when he died, he didn't get a send-off like the rich man. He was probably thrown in the dump, and his body was burned. Kind of shocking, really, but very common in that culture. But there's more about the poor man in verse 22. There's nothing more said about the rich man after he dies until he reaches his destination, Hades. But the poor man in verse 22, we're told, is carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. So at his death, things began to change for him, carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Now what's Abraham's bosom? It's figurative language. What that means is that's the place where Abraham, who was a godly man, that's the place where Abraham went when he died. And as a son of Abraham, the poor man was going to Abraham's bosom. He was going to the place Abraham was to join him in death. And as I said, it's noteworthy that nothing more is said about the rich man until he hits Hades. So verses 23 through 26, In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that dur during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us you you there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and none may cross over from there to us. So there are several possible reactions reactions to those three verses. One is possibly that both of them got what they deserve. You know, there's a part of us that might almost take joy in what the rich man got. Yeah, get it. He lived this life of ease and splendor, and he got his. And that's based on a misunderstanding that many of us have. I think sometimes we believe that heaven is intended to compensate for what we didn't have on earth. But that's not that's not correct. That's not true. The rich man wasn't in hell because he was a rich man, and the poor man wasn't in heaven because he was a poor man. And we'll uh, we'll come back to that. The second possible reaction is that this picture of hell is frightening and offensive. Really when you think of it it is. And that Jesus couldn't really have said that. This couldn't really have been a parable that came from Jesus' lips. By the way, Hades 
is what's referred to in the book, and that means the abode of the unsaved dead, so essentially hell. But uh, obviously, uh, this did come from the lips of Jesus, directly from His lips. And I think the point we should make is that the presentation of the geography of hell is scary and offensive and gruesome, but we shouldn't get hung up on the presentation because this is a parable and Jesus is talking in metaphors. You know, we already talked about what Abraham bo Abraham's bosom means. It's, it's a symbol of heaven, essentially. In verse 23, we're told that the rich man lifted up his eyes. I think we also have, once again, in this concept of the geography of hell, I think we also think somehow hell is at the molten core of the earth. And after all, the rich man looked up into Abraham's bosom, so he must have been way down when he looked up. But hell isn't a location. Hell is actually an entirely different dimension. It's not physical and not a location. In verse 24, we're told that the rich man cried out, I am in agony in this flame. We shouldn't assume that there are flames in hell. The torment in hell is that there's no second chance. The flames are symbols of the fact that it's all over. There's no chance for rest and there's no chance for relief for eternity. I heard someone describe hell once in a very, uh, seemed very accurate way. We're, we all have obsessiveness in one way or another, and I'm like the master of obsessiveness. And obsessiveness by nature can never be satisfied. No matter how obsessive you are, you only can get worse. And he described hell as like obsessiveness for eternity without relief and without satisfaction. Pretty awesome. Or ugly. One of the two. Verse 24, what the rich man asked for is, if Lazarus would dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. You know, once again, that's a symbol. The water symbolizes relief. And what he was looking for was relief to this dilemma of suffering that he was in. This is what he craved, and this is what he could not have in hell. No relief ever for eternity. Now in verse 26, you recall that Abraham said, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed. What's meant by a great chasm? It's not physical. It's not really a grand canyon between him and Lazarus and Abraham. What it is, is the recognition that he's there for eternity with no second chance, with no possibility of change. You know, in, in a sense, the, the physical description of hell sounds pretty awful. But when you think of these symbols for hell, the metaphors for hell, I think they're just as, uh, I think they're just as frightening. I think they're just as frightening. The symbols, though, themselves aren't empty expressions. They mean something. And even though it may not be physical, what they describe about hell is very, very real. And finally, I want to note in verses 23 and 26, it's obvious that the rich man is in hell all alone. You know, you've heard people say, I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to party with all my buddies. We're going to have a 24-7 party in hell. Hell is a lonely place. The rich man was completely alone, completely despairing, completely desolate. <coughs> And even though the pain of hell may not be physical, it's not a place that we want to be. So I recoil at that. You know, the thought of being in a place where I'm all alone, I can never get rest. There's never a possibility of change for eternity, forever, makes me recoil. But we have to bear in mind that God also recoils at it because hell isn't what God wants for us either. Hell is purely our choice. So before we go on, I want to focus in on a few basics since I'm feeling freaked out right now when I think about hell, but I want to make a couple of points. First, heaven and hell are a choice. Heaven and hell are a choice. 
Jesus already paid the price for our sins. He died on the cross for us. Our debt's been paid. So when we say it's a choice, it's not a choice. I'm going to be good today, or I'm going to go to church every Sunday, or I'm going to read the Bible an hour and a half a day. God's already died for our sins. It's not about our performance. He paid our debt, and it was a debt that we couldn't pay, we could never pay. We, we needed a Savior, and that's the purpose that He served. So the choice that we have to make between heaven and hell isn't really the choice to be perfect. I think, I think we ha we're brought up with the idea that you have to be like really good and perfect and you can never say anything wrong or do anything wrong and you have to be kind and gentle and generous and never <coughs> angry. Well, if that's the case, none of, us would have a, none of us would have a chance. But the choice that we have to make is the choice that Paul talked about in, in the Epistle to the Romans in chapter 10, verse 9, when he said, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Two things. Confess Him as your Lord and believe. And you will be saved. That's the choice that we have to make. Now, hell isn't reserved for the rich, although superficially when you read this passage, you might get that impression. Um, it's not reserved for the rich, just like heaven isn't reserved for the poor. The reality, however, is that the rich are more distracted by the world. The more things you have, the more distractions you have, the more self-sufficient you become, the more independent you become, and the less you rely on God. And this was the challenge of the Pharisees. This was the challenge of the Pharisees. Remember, Luke tells us they were lovers of money. Jesus said the same thing. The poor are far more susceptible to relying on God because they don't have the comforts of this world to shore them up. They don't have the means of protecting themselves the way the rich do. They don't live in ease like the rich do. So while this isn't about rich and poor, there are some connections all having to do not with the rich man and the poor man, but the way the world shapes them, the way the world shapes them. So in verses 27 through 31, there's a final matter we need to talk about. And it goes like this. So after he says to Father Abraham, have Lazarus come down, dip his finger in water, put it on my tongue, cool me off from these flames, Abraham shuts him down and says no. He says, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. Okay, leave me alone. I know you're, you've said no. Send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers in order that they, some, that they may be warned and that they will not come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he, the rich man, said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said, he, Abraham, said to the rich man, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. The fact that the rich man couldn't do anything about his condition must have really added to his torment. And so, uh, in a kind of a strange way, his reaction to the shutdown was to show something that almost sounds like love toward his brothers. So why would Abraham say no? Why would Abraham say no? It's certainly not that God is not willing to extend maximum opportunities to us for salvation. That's not why Abraham said no. It's not that God gets to a point and He shuts you down and there's no second or third chance. It was simply that it would have done no good. <clears throat> the rich man's request wasn't granted because it would have been useless to do so. And uh, Abraham points this out in verse 31. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, 
neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Now think about that statement, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. You know, recognize the power in that statement. <clears throat> Jesus was presenting this parable to the Pharisees, who were the rich man. And he was really prophesying about the impact of his own death and resurrection on them. Neither would they be persuaded if someone arose from the dead. He was prophesying about his own impending death and his own impending resurrection from the dead. Did it have any impact? Well, in most cases it didn't. And in fact, that's why Abraham said no. Because if someone came back from the dead to warn us about the need for salvation, it might have an immediate impact on us. But chances are it wouldn't have a lasting impact on us. So I believe that Abraham said no, not because he was trying to be harsh or reflective of some vengeance of God. I think he just recognized that it was too late. It would have been useless. So what's Jesus' purpose in this parable? I think his purpose is to show us that we're the five brothers. The five brothers are really, really us. And like the five brothers, we can't ride anyone else's coattails into heaven. Each of us is responsible for our own spiritual condition and our own salvation. And so what is it, what is uh, necessary in order to motivate us to choose salvation? Is it a deceased relative coming back from the dead? Is it God opening up the heavens and speaking to us? I don't think so, because even when Jesus rose from the dead, many did not believe. And hence, Abraham said in verse 31, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Sad to say, but Abraham was right. The rich man was in hell because he refused to heed Moses and the prophets, not because he was rich. His self-indulgent life, in fact, was a consequence of that. His rejection of God actually led to the self-sufficiency and self-indulgence of his life. Similarly, the poor man was in heaven because he heeded Moses and the prophets. He wasn't in heaven as compensation for the difficult <laughs> life he had had on earth. And I want to say there are rich people in heaven and there are poor people in hell. This passage isn't about that. Now another thing that I think uh, Jesus is telling us here is that death may be the farthest thing from our minds. Maybe the farthest thing from our minds. <clears throat> but the then is determined by the now. Death may be far away. But our condition then <coughs> is determined by the now. <clears throat> And unless we figure out the reality of this situation, there will be no glorious life to come in the afterlife. So in order to figure reality out for each of us, I think we need to take heed of Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament, and particularly take heed of the greatest of the prophets, Jesus. And in fact, that's why we're here every Wednesday night. We're here to grow in that intimate knowledge of Jesus and grow in a relationship with Him. We're here every Wednesday night to take heed of Moses and the prophets, including Jesus, the greatest prophet. So like the five brothers, we need to begin our journey with Jesus right now. Right now. Solomon, the third king of Israel, in the book of Ecclesiastes at 12.1 said, Remember your Creator in your youth, before the evil days come. So he was saying, in effect, now is the day of salvation. He also said in chapter 13 of, or uh, verse 13 of the same chapter of Ecclesiastes, revere God, live by His commandments, this is the wholeness of man. So there's really no time like the present. As Paul told us in 2 Corinthians, today is the day of salvation. And I think this is what this parable is all about.
Was that more than ever you ever wanted to hear about it, Kurt? <laughs> 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 Any thoughts, comments, questions? Ray Ray. I have a thought. Oh. Wow. I have a thought. <laughs> you speak in reference to the hell aspect of it. What I was visualizing from the, the flames and everything was like being um, consumed by suffocation. Like you, you, you can't grasp for air, you can't get no air. It's like you just constantly consumed with pure suffocation. And the other part I was thinking about is the Jesus aspect is you know how we all, we go to Jesus, we go to heaven. You know, we can get to heaven through Jesus, we can get through heaven through Jesus. And that was always taught to me. But um, later on I found out that um, not only can we get to heaven through Jesus, but we allow heaven into us coming to Jesus as well. Right. So, that was my validation. You <laughs> <laughs> liked what you said. <laughs> so, um, so I, I was grasping that even before the, the death, we can still experience heaven and hell right here on earth. It depends on our pursuit. You know, our pursuit will dictate if we um, live and connected with Jesus at the moment. Um, how we feel on the inside because uh, it's been a many times when my outer appearance may look up to par but my inner soul is like being pulled all directions I'm in chaos and confusion but outside it look like yeah Ray Ray got it going on but I'll be actually like living in hell at times but sometimes I'm actually suffocating and I'm consumed so much and then there's other times where I can be in the midst of the storm and still find peace. It's all about my connection at the moment. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. How many times have we read about it? It seems like it uh, involves famous people, movie stars, children of famous people, where our image of them is that they've got it all going on. they got everything. Big house, big house, <coughs> trips, notoriety, success, and then one of them commits suicide. Mm -hmm. Overdoses. You know, I think this idea of hell on earth is very real. I think I think when you embrace Jesus, you do, and your life with Him begins here on earth. And when you reject Him, hell begins here on earth for us. So, I think that's a very good point. So, what about the dogs? What about the dogs? I thought that was an interesting aspect of this parable. I'm looking at Liz. What about the dogs? Look at the dogs. Why we, we we recently lost a beloved dog of 14 years, and a friend of mine said to me his reaction. And this guy's a tough guy. I would have never thought he had this in him. He start, I told him about it, and he said, "You know that happened to me last year. He, I love I lost my Shih Tzu. I would have never thought this guy would have this. You know." Uh, Rottweiler or something. I lost my beloved Shih Tzu. He died and he said, you know, I came to the conclusion that God puts dogs in our life to help us through a period of time when we need their help. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're like angels. What happened when the we don't need them no more? What happened when we don't need them anymore? Well, the, the guy I'm referring to, his explanation is when you don't need him anymore, God takes him away. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, don't say that. Kind of an interesting <laughs> thought. <laughs> Stay needy. Keep needing those dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Your life may depend on it. Yeah. 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 My son brought home a little tiny box that said meow, and I told him to put him in the room. Well, during this time, he was into math, and um, this little meow got pregnant. And that was the only thing that got me through all the stuff that he was going through. Because while he was walking and living in death, there was life. I was seeing life yeah. and experiencing life. So don't say, God takes it away when you don't need it. I was just kidding. <laughs> the good news is, is, you know, he's living life now. There is, there is light at the end of that dark 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 hole that everybody gets in right so he is living life i mean he's not totally up there yet because he's still he's replaced other stuff 
with the meth, but um, he's seeing and he's living and he's being responsible. So, um, you know, we need, like you said, we need, God puts animals into our lives for a very specific reason. And I thank God every day <laughs> that they're there for us yeah. because, like this person said back here, they love us when nobody else does. Exactly. You know? They do. And when well, they die, they're not. Perfect yeah, picture here yeah. in the parable. Mm -hmm. Only the dogs would associate with him, no one else. Kurt? Yeah, a couple, a couple things I, I wanted to say. Uh, David's sister had said the passage, there's somewhere in the Bible that says that, that pets are on loan to us from God. We mm -hmm. do not own our pet. They are on loan to us. And so it makes sense to me that you say that um, they serve a purpose. Um, I uh, We lost our beloved uh, pet a few months ago. And um, as a human on this earth, I cannot think of one reason why God would want to take this pet from us. I can't, I can't, I can't think of one. I can't justify one, but all I can do is I can say, I can look at David and I can say, you know, remember, we have our pictures out and I say, you say, remember the grief, the horrible, 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 horrible grief. And when we have a disagreement, something that's not going quite so right in the day, Remember that grief. Remember how horrible that grief is. And you know, that's not a good reason enough for me to take her away from us. But it's something that I can hang on to. Right. To say that her life meant that. It's like, you know what? That's the grief and then some that we go through. Go through. There's nothing, nothing, nothing more important on her than we go to each other and kind to each other. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the reason I wanted to ask you about tonight's Bible study, I didn't know you were going to do it, was. And, you know, to me, if, if a person were in hell, I don't see how you can do anything other than scream and scream, right, and scream. How you can have a conversation with someone to talk to your brothers, to tell them to repent so they don't have to go through the trumpet that you're going through and ask for a drop of water in your tongue, is, it just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, if you're on fire and you're in, like embers and you're burning, yeah. you're not going to be having a conversation, let alone one that makes sense. No, I, I agree. And, yeah. and that's why this is a parable. So I think what God's doing is getting into his head. Right. And I think about this, you know, if you got caught up in flames and were burned, you would eventually die. I mean, you wouldn't last that long. This is an eternity that eternity. is lasting. That's what I was going to say, when you think of eternity, I mean, really, if you sit down for two seconds and you think, you know, a, a person, a murderer gets a life sentence, or three consecutive life sentences, or ten years for a rape, or whatever, but for eternity, yeah. you are burning for eternity. That's I mean, I can't even, my brain can't comprehend. I can't imagine. And on and on and on. There's not, oh, 10 years, you burn for 10 years and you're done. Five years, you're done. <laughs> yeah, right. On and on and on. And it really makes me stop and appreciate and I think about what is going on around me because I don't want to be in that situation. I, I don't want my friends, I don't want my loved ones. Right. I don't want anybody to be tormented in such a way that it never happens. You've got Jesus. You've never got to think about being That's why we confess and believe. Sadiq. Well, to, to address what he was saying, um, <clears throat> it's been said in some other faiths that if God can, who was it that was put into the fire and the fire didn't burn him? No, it was, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach. Yeah. But there was another person by it also. Uh, the guy walking, he was bound? No, he was put into the fire, and then uh, Gabriel came to him and asked him, do you want me to take you out of the fire? He said, no, if God wants to take me out, God take me, and God told the fire not to burn him. Just just like the story about, uh, who was it, in Jonah and the whale? So the whale not to swap. Jesus in the fire. Yeah. Okay, well... The point, the point is that if God can do whatever God can do, which God can do whatever God wants to do, then hell could be like the description. God could put you somewhere where you could be constantly burning and then your skin could constantly replace. Or you could be in a spiritual burning continuously to, 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 as, as a punishment if you want to believe in that kind of a God, a punishing God. So therefore, anything's possible for God. So to say... It doesn't make sense. Of course, it doesn't make sense to us because we can't do it. Right. But for a God that can say, "Let there be light," and everything exists, anything's possible. That's right. So for us to sit and try to second guess God is sort of egotistical on our part. Mm -hmm. To say, "Well, that couldn't be possible." 
Because well, anything, anything's possible. Right. You're right. When I think about hell, I think of it as a mental torment more so than I would think about having skin in hell. Uh, I think of it as being a, just a mental anguish or torment. I think the point is uh, it's not a place we want to be. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, I've never thought about being there. He said a soul-based level, and what Ray Ray said, uh, it's an uh, inside burning. Like if we just, Simply, if we lead the path away from Jesus Christ, we're going to end up in a whether it's metaphorical or a yeah. physical thing, we're going to be burning from the inside. Right. Suffering. It's, you know what it's anybody's pain. concept is of hell, whether it exists, whether it doesn't exist, what it is, what it isn't, I personally would rather believe that something exists and find out that it doesn't. Right. Yeah. Than not believe that it does and say, oh, no, I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a choice. Right it's a choice we choose. <laughs> And um, the choice is really an easy choice because the hard work's already been done for us. The hard work's already been done. David. Kurt, I think you have the exact uh, thing right, and that is that this story and the whole point of hell, which is hard to understand, and even heaven to understand, we, we can all sit here and talk about heaven for quite some time, too. But the point is, you don't want to be separated from God. So that ought to not create any fear of God. He wants me to be close to Him. It ought to create a, a desire for my loved ones that don't know Him, and not only my loved ones, but everyone else who doesn't. And that's, I mean, I think that's where you hit. It's about the five brothers. It's about coming to a place where it's like, there are people who don't know. And if I live my life of nice luxury, whether it's in purple or it's just sitting in front of the television all day long, and not do anything to help those people, then I don't really have love. I just, I just say, well, I don't really care. So I think you've got it exactly right. It's more important that we think about who God has around us than we don't know. And so thank you. I was thinking the exact same thing, David, as I was sitting here. That it's that um, it's the knowing that this is real, no matter what real looks like, that this is real. <coughs> That's why we do what we do here, right? It's because you know, we all have a burden for lost souls. And, and this shouldn't be just a, well, we do this once a week because we enjoy getting together. Like, this needs to be a burden, a burden for lost souls. And I often think of Jerry telling of the story of Hacksaw Ridge. I don't know how many people saw that movie. Mm -hmm. Where the sol soldier yeah. went in, and he went to rescue just one more. And he kept saying, you know, they were all retreating because they, they finally got off, off the hill and they were in, you know, in an area of safety. Soldier kept saying it's based on a true, true story. He kept going back in and rest, throwing one more over his, over his back, and just one more. You know, and that's the attitude we need to have toward, toward lost souls. It's just one more. You know, every day, just one. More. That's right. And the burden is just to expose them. It's just right. to expose them to the Word of God that's and uh, in, make the introduction. Everybody is responsible for their own salvation. I can't make someone be sure. saved. They have to choose to be saved, but I can introduce them to Jesus and tell them about him. <coughs> well, that's the that's our attraction. Um, Thank you. Right. Mom. Okay. Mom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sell it. Um, what, I, what I'm getting out of this is that when you have something so close to you, you can grow attached or and it becomes what is love and love is eternal so when it's gone it's that's what makes it eternal love it's something you're longing for and like today i <coughs> i came out here and somebody made a comment about carrying the cross and i noticed that moses ha had the commandments of you know any image driven by wood or um brimstone which is you know god is a jealous god and um knowing this you know i'm thinking well should i take off my cross and don't have it on me i'm not attached to it in that way but i have had some experiences with it so i don't know if by knowing this already by the wisdom by knowing by love what it represents i feel like i have to take off my cross now and not wear it because of what of moses of the commandments so my little kind of Confused. I want to Unsure. Yeah. Well, I, wear, I wear my cross every single day, this little cross. 
and to me it's a tool. Somebody says, oh, it's a nice cross. I say, well, it reminds me of my very best friend, Jesus. Yeah, that's I love to talk about him because he loves me and died for me and he loves you too. To me, it's, a, it's not only remembering it for myself, but using it as an opportunity every chance I get to do just what Kurt said, tell somebody about his love. So it's, it's not about... I mean, it can be something that you're acting as like a symbol, but it's not like that for you. Yeah, because I wasn't, I wasn't so, like, I feel... Yeah, don't let that burn you. You worship I, a graven image. I don't like take it off and yeah. get on my knees and bow. I don't do anything like that. I just wear it. But what other people's perspectives say, now that you really know God, you shouldn't be carrying that. And right. and I can go back and, you know, the Catholics, they carry a cross. And when the, they're doing exorcism, mm -hmm. they would take the cross and they will, the demons are afraid <clears throat> of that. And I have kind of an out-of-body experience where <laughs> they're looking at that and these whatever people out there are looking at it and they're saying, oh, she's protected, she's protected. And they actually, it's like an out-of-body experience almost. They stay away from so, well, yeah. I, I don't know how to, because of what I heard today of Moses saying about the, the commandments, you know, and it's one of them says about other gods and saying, like it's made out of stone, like the Buddha's made out of stone, and people bow to it. I mean, it's, it's I don't, I mean, I'm a little... When you're worshiping God, you're not worshiping the cross, even though the cross may represent one aspect of God, Jesus' earthly ministry, that he was crucified, died for our sins, and was resurrected. Wearing the cross isn't the same as paying yeah. tribute to a graven image. I don't think you should be concerned about that. Oh. I like David's explanation. We do that because people will ask you about the cross and it gives you an opportunity to introduce them to Jesus. Just say next time, I'm not wearing this for me, I'm wearing it for you. That's nice. Oh, Alex. I give a short story. I befriend this young woman who has low self-esteem. Louder. I said I befriended somebody who had a low self-esteem, although she was very very successful in my own point of view. And she told me something very powerful. She said, your daughter will come back to you when she need you, when she need your help. And uh, I was completely hopeless that she would to come back. We had some words of change. And then and somebody mentioned the dog. Her beloved dog, uh, let's, let's say that uh, her mother I did a foul play and the dog was gone. And uh, my daughter called me in the middle of the night and uh, told, and I didn't, I missed the call because I said, that's her number. And she told me in February that we are pretty much gone for each other. <coughs> and then later when we connected the first for to the text because she could not even bear to hear my voice. <coughs> I, I did some things, and, and there are uh, things in between us. But, but then, because of that dog who went for her everything and her business and everything, she came back to me and Sally met her, and uh, she came to see me, which, ah, and then I told to Emily, yeah, she came and I said, yeah, I know, she will, she will go back. So when somebody said the dog, the dog had a purpose to bring back yes. my dog, to bring back my daughter. Yes. Even for one day yes. to see her and to meet my friend. That is, that is, I feel bad for my daughter dog. But if this brought us even for one day, I mean, she didn't exactly. respond it later, but. The dogs definitely serve a purpose. Yes, they do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mark.